I'm uh, going to uh, start right away. And I know that um, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, and Faulkner are very much iconic figures of American literature. Um, and probably you guys are here uh, because you know something about those authors already. So I'm not going to be going over a lot of material that you guys know already. Instead, what I'd like to do is to come up with a little bit of uh, material that might be uh, somewhat surprising to you. And um, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, three analytic scales. Uh, this is kind of a critical paradigm that we'll be using um, throughout the semester, uh, which the, the, the use of three analytic scales to talk about the authors. So first of all, there's the macro history of the United States and the world. And two texts come to mind, both Hemingway's, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and To Have and Have Not. Uh, so that's the largest possible level. Um, and then we'll go down a little bit to the next level, um, which is um, still large, um, but it has to do with narrative experiments. Um, of modernism and the text that we're reading can all be called modernist texts uh, in one way or another. Um, so we'll be looking at the sound of theory specifically uh, for that register, that analytic register of experimentation. Um, and finally, we'll be looking at the smallest possible scale, micro level. Um, and it has to do with sensory details. And in fact, all three of them uh, are wonderful on sensory details, but today we'll just be talking about one text, uh, The Great Gatsby, uh, and one particular moment when the registering of the sensory world is very important. Um, so let me um, go to um, Hemingway and uh, talk a little bit about him um, in many ways as a kind of a gateway or a guy uh, to global vision of American literature. Um, Hemingway was very much a world traveler. Um, he, um, you know, basically can get a map of the world by just looking at his writings. Um, but he had a special love of the Spanish language. Um, so, um, for whom the bell tolls, uh, we'll be reading this in our class, uh, is about the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and Hem Hemingway was there as a war correspondent. Um, and, but we can see that he actually got into combat situations right here. It's, um, so uh, it's, 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 uh, it's really interesting to think about uh, Hemingway as both a journalist and also um, a, 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 a novelist. Um, so there's the global dimension of Hemingway, uh, but also the global dimension of the Spanish Civil War itself. It was a civil war. It was between um, two sides um, fighting in Spain. Um, but it was also very much an international war um, in the sense that uh, Russia was a part of it, Germany was a part of it, Italy was a part of it. Um, so it very much was uh, a gathering of um, a lot of nations uh, converging on the soil of Spain um, and fighting a war that in name was the Spanish Civil War but actually in action, in terms of this cast of players, was very much an international war. Um, so um, this is one level at which we can understand Hemingway, is that he really was a player um, in a very large scale map of the world. Um, and because he was such a player on a large scale map, uh, we shouldn't be surprised that he would be going to other countries as well. And his love for the Spanish language uh, would take him to Cuba. Um, so uh, we'll be reading To Have and Have Not, uh, which is about Cuba. Um, and this is a very um, unforgettable uh, image of uh, Hemingway and Castro. Uh, we might not know that they uh, were actually uh, good friends. Uh, so this is just something that you know, we should keep in mind as we read Hemingway. Um, and Hemingway, actually, uh, the Spanish Civil War ended in 1939. Um, and from 1939, to 1960, he actually lived in Cuba. Um, he wrote a lot of his uh, important novels there. The Old Man and the Sea was written when he was living in Cuba. So you know, again, a very important fact to bear in mind. Um, and this is um, the interior of his house in Cuba. 
Um, and I don't know, I'll put all of this, the PowerPoint uh, on our website so you'll be able to see the detail. But this is a cigar box that was given to Hemingway. Um, and on the cigar bo box it says, uh, Gran Amico de Cuba, great friend of Cuba. Um, so um, he, Hemingway, uh, it, 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 right now, it's not just an American author, but very much a Cuban um, author um, in Cuba. Um, so um, we, we won't actually be talking about Castro's Cuba, to have and have not, um, actually took place earlier, but this is just uh, kind of a continuing relation uh, that Hemingway has to that country. Um, so, okay, so we'll move on now to the next scale uh, of analysis, um, and this is the, narrative experiment, um, the very um, striking uh, narrative styles that we see um, in this body of writing. Um, and no more so than in The Sound of the Fury. Um, I think that if we've read that novel, we know that it's impossible just to read it once and understand all of it, right? This is the kind of novel that really compels us to go back to read several times um, because of the level of experimentation um, in, in that novel. So this is from the opening of uh, The Sound of the Fury. And you guys probably know that there are four sections to The Sound of the Fury. Um, and the first section is told uh, by Benji, who's clinically retarded. So this is all the action is unfolding um, in the mind of someone who's not really registering the world um, most of us do. So let's just see uh, how Benji understands the world, how he takes in the world. Did you come to meet Caddy, she said, rubbing my hands. What is it? What are you trying to tell Caddy? Caddy smelled like trees, and like when she says, we were asleep. What are you moaning about, Luster said. You can watch again when we get to the branch. Here, here's you, a Jimson wig. He gave me the flower. Makes no sense, right? Right now, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, but I have to tell you that this is actually a conflation of two moments in time. The first moment takes place when Benji was just a young boy. The second ita in italics um, takes place when uh, Benji is actually 33 years old. Um, so we don't usually tell the story that way, jumping across such a vast space of time. Uh, but that's exactly uh, the kind of narrative technique that Faulkner uses in, in The Sound of Fury. Um, and the numerous advantages uh, and challenges to that kind of writing. Um, but one um, interesting fact that emerges from this little moment um, is that a young white girl, Caddy is Benji's sister, a young white girl is seen in intimate parallel with a young black boy who's Luster, the black servant who's taking care of Benji. So what could be the connection between a young white girl and a young black boy? It turns out that it really has everything to do with smell. Benji loves Caddy and she smells like trees to him. I don't think that Benji actually registers Caddy as a person. She's really just a smell to him. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, I think that most of us actually register people in that way, you know, taking in one very specific aspect uh, of other people. But I think that Benji especially does that. Um, so it is Caddy's smell that means everything in the world, really, to Benji. Um, and when Luster gives him the Jimson wheat, it is not exactly the smell of Caddy, but it's close enough so that Luster is actually the closest that Benji can get to in the very sad times when he's 33, when he's really lost everything that he loves in the world. Luster and the Jimson Wheat is the closest that he can get back to Caddy. So this is the linkage. The way that Faulkner is telling the story is not based on linear chronology. It is based on the logic of association in our minds and different people have different logics of association. And Benji's logic of association is completely based on the sense of smell, based on sound as well, but in this moment especially. So um, we can tell that 
uh, we can say mm. that in some sense Hemingway has taken us to a foreign country, you know, taking us to Spain and to Cuba. Um, and Faulkner has also mm. taken us to a foreign country in the sense that the mind of a retarded person is a sort of foreign country to those of us who are not retarded. And this is a very interesting kind of foreign country um, to go to um, and to steep ourselves in. Um, so finally, um, we'll move on to the uh, smallest possible scale, uh, which is uh, also actually related to what we've just seen in Faulkner. Uh, but this is an early moment in The Great Gatsby, um, and it is about Daisy, one of the most famous characters in American literature. Um, and this is Nick Carraway, the narrator, talking about Daisy, his cousin. Um, so Nick is not retarded, he's highly intelligent. But um, his take on Daisy is interesting in that it is not necessarily the take that we would have to our cousins. Think about how we think about our cousins. Probably not, nothing like this. So her voice compelled me forward breathlessly as I listened. Then the glow faded, each light deserted, deserting her with lingering regret like children leaving a pleasant street at dusk. Highly idiosyncratic, the idiosyncrasy of a highly intelligent person, but in many ways as unusual as Benji's mind. So Nick tends to conflate different senses. He's talking about the quality of sound of Daisy, but he's use, using visual images to talk about that quality of sound. So Daisy's voice fading out it's like children leaving the street at dusk. It's a very interesting visual image to talk about a certain quality of sound. Why does he want to do that? Why does Fitzgerald want to write in that way? Why is it that the visual register is being invoked in order to talk about the quality of sound? That's one of the questions that we'll be thinking about as we move on um, in our class. So, um, so far you've noticed um, that I've associated one scale of analysis with one author, right? So Hemingway is associated with the largest possible scale, um, Faulkner with kind of a middle scale, and Fitzgerald with a micro level. Um, it, we could do it that way, um, but I don't really want you to get the impression um, that one author is to be associated only with that one particular scale. So in the rest of the lecture, what I'd like to do is to talk about one phenomenon that is a cross-scale phenomenon, that is something that invites experience on all three levels, on the largest possible scale, on the mid-level and smaller scale as well, that all three authors talk about to some extent. Maybe they don't talk about it in a kind of frontal way, uh, but they engage it in some fashion. So it's an important um, event for them. Um, and it's not surprising that war should be an important event to all three authors, because the body of writings that we're looking at um, really all come right after World War I. So World War I is, in some sense, the unspoken horizon right behind all of these writings. Um, and uh, we'll be talking about war today and talk about war generally um, as the most obvious level, which is large scale uh, geopolitics. Um, and to some extent, when you have action happening on that scale, there's a kind of a loss of individual agency um, and the narrative problem that comes with that. Um, there's also the, de the problem of the deformation of language. Um, the way that words uh, get used as euphemisms um, in, under conditions of war, um, and what that does to language in general. Um, and then we'll talk about war as a psychic phenomenon, um, combat trauma, and the psychology of homecoming. All of this we're familiar, all of these are, are just things that happen when we go to war. Um, but World War I is especially um, important to think in terms of those lines, because this is, in many ways, the first war uh, that, um, that, that was not only fought on a scale that was unprecedented, um, but also different war strategies were being tried out. So one of the very important features 
of World War I was trench warfare, and that this is really what we see here. Um, people digging themselves in and staying in those um, trenches for months and years, really. Um, and to experience war is no more than people firing at you um, and then being sunk in mud. Um, mud is the most important um, sensory material that people actually remember about the war. Um, World War I is, uh, was, is also important because uh, chemical warfare was introduced. Um, and so in this image, um, we see uh, actually British soldiers uh, who suffer from uh, poison gas in World War I. Um, just looking at these images, uh, we can see that this is really not a glorious war. It is not a heroic war. It is a war that is impossible to romanticize. Uh, you know, when you're stuck in those conditions, there's almost no way you can prove that you are a brave person. Personal bravery doesn't really come into play under those conditions of war. So it is a war that is impossible to feel good about. No matter how brave you are, you can't get the satisfaction that comes from that kind of bravery. Um, and so um, there are a number of consequences uh, of that uh, impossibility of feeling heroic, impossibility of getting any kind of emotional satisfaction from fighting. Paul Fussell, who's a very um, insightful uh, and important critic, uh, wrote a book called The Great War and Modern Memory, um, and uh, is a kind of a celebrated uh, classic on, on war and literature. Uh, and he, this is what he says, what he claims. Um, the primal scene is undeniably horrible, but its irony, its dynamics of hopes a bridge, is what haunts the memory. I'm saying that there seems to be one dominating form of modern understanding that it is essentially ironic, that it originates in the application of mind and memory to the events of the Great War, and Great War is World War I. Um, so Paul Faso claims that the war structures human experience, both those who were actually fighting and civilians back at home or people who come back to civilian life, as basically an ironic structure through which we experience the world. What does that mean? We'll be looking more to think about what it means to experience the world through the lens of RNA. Uh, but right now we can also get a little bit of what um, Fuzzle means just from this one passage. Uh, it has to do with the dynamics of hopes a bridge. What does it mean to live without any kind of hope for yourself or for the outcome of the war? In some sense, hope is not even linked to victory, which is a really radical claim. That it doesn't really matter if you're on the winning side. That doesn't really give you grounds for hope. Why would that be the case? Um, and, uh, and, that, and the other claim that Fasso is making um, is that irony is basically a mental structure that structures our memory as well. It is not just our immediate reaction to the war when you're going through it that you can make ironic comments about things that are happening. But when you think about it, when you bring it back to your mind afterwards, the irony is the structure by which you recall something and live that event over again. What does it mean to have an ironic recall in relation to your own experience? Um, so let's look at Paul Fuzzo's claim um, through the three authors um, who have written uh, very memorable things about those phenomena. Uh, and I'm very glad to be able to talk a little bit about Farewell to Arms. We're not reading Farewell to Arms um, in this class. Um, some of you might have read it on your own. But this is a celebrated moment um, in Farewell to Arms, um, talking about the effect of war on language and how it makes it impossible for us to use certain words. I was always, this is the protagonist, Frederick Henry, I was always embarrassed by the words sacred, glorious, and sacrifice, and the expression in vain. We had heard them sometimes standing in the rain, almost out of earshot, so that only the shouted words came through and had read them on proclamations now for a long time. And I had seen nothing sacred, and the things that were glorious had no glory and the sacrifices 
were like stockyards in Chicago if nothing was done with the meat except to bury it. Abstract words such as glory, honor, courage, or hello were obscene beside the concrete names of villages, the number of regiments, and the dates. This is Hemingway writing in Farewell to Arms. But in some sense, this really describes the whole Hemingway that we know, right? The importance of dates, the importance of places, um, the importance of numbers. Um, this is a lifelong habit for Hemingway. And here we, in some sense, see the origins of that way of writing, the very clean, very economical, very not really kind of writing, um, in, is in some sense a response to the circumstances of war. It's almost as if war makes it impossible to do a romantic kind of writing. And Hemingway's writing is the kind of the counterpoint to a flowery, uh, to a heroic, to a romantic kind of writing. So on the level of use of words, certain words just become impossible to use. But I think that um, irony also extends uh, to a larger scale, uh, which has to do really with uh, the way we tell a story whether or not we can tell a story in a straightforward fashion. And Paul Fussell suggests, and I'd like to test this with Hemingway, is whether or not after World War I, it is still possible to tell a story in a completely linear, straightforward fashion. Um, is there something about war that makes it almost necessary in order to tell the story from the side, tell it in a truncated version, tell it in a jumbled version, as we've seen in Benji, um, or tell it in some way that is mixed up. You know, all those things that we recognize in all, the, all three authors, maybe it has to do with war. So right now I sort of just outline, you know, some things to look for as we're reading this authors. One is the twisted logic of events, um, and um, that things are just not working out, not landing where we would expect them to land. Um, the possibility of symmetry of blame, which seems a logical consequence when we have no heroes. Um, and our focus retelling of the past, not looking at the event frontally, but looking at it in a blurry fashion. Um, and then there could be some point in being blurry. Usually being blurry is not a narrative advantage. But it could be that under some circumstances, Blurriness is actually a cultivated effect and is designed to um, do something. You know, so the work that is being done by being blurry. Um, understated emotions, we know something about, right? Hemingway is famous for that, um, just being totally um, giving us the minimal expression. Um, understated emotions. Um, and then the possibility of counterintuitive outcome. So this is just a kind of schematic way of laying out some of the things that we're looking for um, that will test once again, um, by looking at specific passages. Uh, so, you know, I just said that Hemingway, uh, Fitzgerald, and Faulkner all engaged World War I in some fashion, but I should qualify that by saying that the engagement is sometimes quite oblique. So Hemingway actually fought in World War I. Um, he was an ambulance driver. Um, and so he did, he was actually in the war. Um, but he got wounded very quickly. He got wounded after a few months. He was out of commission for the rest of the war. So he didn't actually experience World War I in any deep way. Um, and even though he, he talks about World War I in Farewell to Arms, really his deepest experience of war is actually a war that came a little later, which is the Greco-Turkish War, um, a horrendous event. Um, I think it's safe to say that there really um, is there are no good guys in that, in that war. Uh, both the Turks and the Greeks were equally reprehensible. Um, this is an image uh, of the burning of Smyrna, um, 1922. And the first story um, that we'll be reading in, in our time is on the key at Smyrna. So this is the background <coughs> to that Hemingway story. Um, and I'll be reading you um, two passages uh, by Hemingway to think about what irony means 
for Hemingway. Uh, first of all, this is a, an image of the leader on the Turkish side, and he's actually, uh, to Turk is actually the founder of Turkey, of present-day Turkey. So a very important historical figure that also actually figures in Hemingway's account of that war. Um, so this is um, Hemingway, this passage, is Hemingway once again going to cover the Greco-Turkish War as a war correspondent. He was writing uh, for the Toronto Star. Um, and this is the uh, news article that he sent to the Toronto Star. It is oil that Kamal Ataturk and company won Mesopotamia for. And it is oil that Great Britain wants to keep Mesopotamia for. So the East that is disappointed in Kamal the Saladin because he shows no indication to plunge into a fanatical holy war, may yet get the war from Kamal, the businessman. Okay. So this actually has a kind of current resonance. It's about oil uh, in the Middle East. Um, and um, was frustrating about Atutuk um, to um, this, the, the religious side, Islamic side is that he turns out not to be a fanatic at all. He's totally cool and completely deliberate and deliberative in his moves. He's not going to plunge into any unwise war. So you're not going to get someone fighting a fanatical religious war. War is not going to happen because of religious fanaticism. War is going to happen because of economic rationality coming from the importance Oil. So that is really the irony that Hemingway, as a war correspondent, is pointing to, is that some wars are highly rational. We can't really say that it's an irrational war. We can't really say that a war is bad because it's irrational, because some wars are highly rational. And this is, is supremely mm -hmm. ironical. Hemingway is not pro-war. All he's saying mm -hmm. is that this is a war that is driven by economic rationality. So this is one side of irony, is that things are not lining up. The good guys don't look like good guys, and the bad guys are bad guys, not because they look like the bad guy that we would expect, them, would expect bad guys to look like. So it, it, it's just, and it happens on the largest possible scale. It's really the global geopolitics of war that's creating this monster that is attitude, but who's also a model of economic rationality. Um, so the other, um, a bit of irony of war is actually uh, what we'll be reading is the first story in, in our time on the key uh, at Smyrna. Uh, and this is the concluding paragraph of that story. The Greeks were nice chaps too, the losing side. The Greeks were nice chaps too. When they evacuated, they had all the baggage, animals they couldn't take off with them. So they just broke the forelegs and dumped them into the shallow water. All those mules with the forelegs broken pushed mm -hmm. over into the shallow water. It was all a pleasant business. My word, yes, a most pleasant business. So, so much for the brutality of the Turks and so much for the victimhood of the Greeks. Victimhood is something that actually extends from those who experience it into a condition they can, that they then, then confer on other people. There's no glory, there's no moral advantage to being a victim in a war because the victims are just as reprehensible as the victors. So this is really, I think, that what Paul Fussell means by saying that, that there's really an abridgment of hope in a war like this, is that we can't really go and fight for the Greeks, you know, because they are the victims of the Turkish aggressors. We can't really say that, because the Greeks are aggressors too. They're aggressors on their own mules, on their own um, animals of transportation. Um, so it, it, it is um, a world in which um, that is, in some sense, that has been emptied of moral meaning, emptied of moral virtue. Um, and to the extent that that makes it impossible to take sides with any sat satisfaction, it is a very, very desolate landscape, emotional as well as moral landscape. So this is really what irony means for Hemingway, is that it is an impossible place to inhabit. It is unbearable to 
talk about it directly or straightforwardly. And the only way you can talk about it is being ironic and using talking about it in a particular tone of voice. So a very important component of irony is the tone of voice. And in that sense, our senses are important as well. Use our ears to listen to Hemingway as we read his words on the page. Um, so let's move on now um, to Fitzgerald and the great Gatsby. Fitzgerald um, actually um, did not have um, a very extensive um, experience of World War I either. He actually um, and he, he enlisted, but he didn't actually get to fight um, in World War I. So this is a really interesting um, reaction of someone uh, who wants to talk about the war as, in some sense, the central event of his generation, um, but who didn't actually have a kind of a personal acquaintance uh, with that central event. So this is from The Great Gatsby. Um, and uh, is, uh, at this point, uh, we haven't been introduced to Gatsby, right? Because you guys know that Nick Carraway is the one who's been telling the story um, for a good part of the time as The Great Gatsby begins. And he's just meeting this fellow um, that he's making conversation with. Your face is familiar, he said politely. Weren't you in the first division in the war? Why, yes, I was in the 28th Infantry. I was in the 16th until June 1918. I knew I've seen you somewhere before. We talked for a moment about some wet, gray little villages in France. Okay. I can tell you, we can go to the Gatsby and see that this is taken from the Great Gatsby but it could have been written by Hemingway, right? Exactly all those points that he makes in Farewell to Arms about the importance of the number of your division, dates, places. Fitzgerald writes exactly as Hemingway says people would write under conditions of war because those are the only details, completely unemotional, factual, plain numbers plain geographical facts. Those are the only things you can bear to name because to name anything else is in some sense an insult to your own experience and an insult to the English language. Um, so I don't think that you know most of us actually talk, think about The Great Gatsby um, as a war novel and it is not. So don't, you know, don't think that I'm trying to create a reading um, of The Great Gatsby based on the importance of World War I. No, uh, it is not a war, a war novel. Um, but it is significant that this person that Nick is talking to is Gatsby, of course, and that they do have World War I in common. That they both actually were combat soldiers in World War I. Um, and that's part of the bond between Nick and Gatsby, what it means for that to be the beginning of a relationship between the two of them. Um, so in that sense, The Great Gatsby is shadowed by World War I, and we can think of various ways in which war or the phenomenon of war functions as a shadow and unspoken, barely alluded to, but nonetheless not inconsequential, not trivial event that we should bear in mind as we read on about Gatsby and about Nick. Um, so one other, um, finally, you shouldn't be surprised that we'll be moving on um, to Faulkner. Um, and I should uh, tell you something about Faulkner, which is um, really very unheroic. I mean, we've been talking about World War I as a very unheroic uh, war, but um, Faulkner's own conduct um, is especially unheroic. Uh, Faulkner actually went to Canada um, in 1918 to enlist in the Royal Air Force. Um, so he enlisted, never saw action. Um, his brother actually was seriously wounded in World War I. Um, but for the rest of his life, Faulkner actually claimed that he fought, actually fought in World War I. Um, this is not something that he claimed for a while, you know, not like 1919 or 1920. 1943, he's still claiming to his nephew that he was in action in World War I. I mean, this is kind of a shocking fact about Faulkner. I don't know what to do with that, except that it's just there, you know, in his biography. So uh, Faulkner writes to his nephew, Jimmy Faulkner, um, I would have liked for you to have had my dog tag 
Royal Air Force, but I lost it in Europe and Germany. I think the Gestapo has it. I'm very likely on the records right now as a dead British flying officer spy. So, um, well, I mean, you know, it's, um, that's just a fact, and we can do what we want with that. Um, Faulkner did write a novel um, called um, Soldier's uh, Home. Uh, it, um, I'll, I'll give you the reference. His, 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 his first novel um, is actually about a veteran coming back. Um, so I will put that on, on, the, on, on the website. Um, so he actually does write about World War I, uh, but um, he, for, for the most part, he's not known as someone who writes about World War I. Um, and instead, um, he actually, uh, we can say that there are shadows of uh, war in, of World War I in all his writings about the American Civil War, which is obviously what is appropriate to Faulkner to write about. Um, and he's not making anything up when he's writing about the American Civil War. But what is interesting about Faulkner's writing about the American Civil War is that of the three authors, war is actually the only, Faulkner is actually the only author that gives us, who gives us a heroic, idealistic, possibly romantic image of war. Someone who did not fight in World War I can actually give us a utopian account of war. I think that it's, it's interesting that Hemingway would not be capable of writing anything like this, even about the Civil War, although he's idealistic about the Civil War as well. Um, Faulkner is the only person, because of his complicated relation to World War I, that for him, the Civil War is actually an affirmative moment in a kind of twisted, counterintuitive way. So this is a novel um, that we won't be reading, but it's a great novel, so I encourage you to read this on your own uh, if you have a chance um, after this class. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's, about, it's really about the Civil War as the background to the novel, um, or it, in the sense that it doesn't really appear in it. Um, but a good part of it, um, some of it, uh, is about the women left behind. Um, and I'll, I'll just read you this moment, and then we can talk about it. Now there's two white women and a negress. Now there's three Negroes or three whites. Not even as three women, but merely as three creatures who still possess the need to eat, but took no pleasure in it. The need to sleep, but from no joy in weariness or regeneration. We grew and tended and harvested with our own hands the food we ate made and worked that garden just as we cooked and ate the food which came out of it with no distinction among the three of us of age or color. It was as though we were one being, interchangeable and indiscriminate. Um, we already have seen in The Sound of Fury that for the races to be interchangeable and indiscriminate between Caddy and Buster is a good thing for Wagner. And for here, the Civil War is what enables that breakdown of racial distinction to take place. Usually, being interchangeable is not really a good quality um, for, for us. It's an insult to our individuality. Um, but here, it is under the circumstances of deprivation when all you can do is just to keep your body afloat, just to make sure that um, you can put something into your belly. When that is the basic condition of life, and when everyone has to work towards the fulfillment of that condition, um, then race really doesn't matter. So this is a really, um, for Faulkner, really emblematic moment um, when whites as well as blacks have to work just as hard, that labor is just a given uh, for the mistress as for the slaves. Um, and when there's just a complete commingling of lives um, in, 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 in every aspect of daily life. Um, for Faulkner, that is one of the consequences of the Civil War, 
is that even though there is a battle going on um, and deadly consequences of the battle um, that are dividing the nation in one sense, you know, nothing can be more divisive than the civil war. Even though the nation is being torn apart by the war, there is a strange kind of healing, a strange kind of unity that's coming from that division, which is the very local, very personal, everyday unity between those who are left behind to tend for themselves and the necessity of acting as one. So it's three people, blacks and whites, acting as one and war as the necessary condition. It's really the genetic ground for that kind of configuration of three people acting as if they were of one mind and of one body. It is a supremely utopian vision of war. Um, and ironically, both for good and ill, it is Faulkner who never fought in World War I who's capable of imagining that utopian um, uh, possibility. So, you know, I would say that, that this is a kind of irony that Paul Fussell wasn't really thinking about, right, for, for him. Irony basically is a kind of a negative phenomenon. But I would argue that we can actually also extend Paul Fussell's insight to say that the irony of war is such that one of the counterintuitive outcomes would actually include an affirmative understanding of war. Um, and actually, we see this all the time, the bond among comrades, among people, you know, GIs bonding. Um, that's just a phenomenon that, that we know about. Um, and what Faulkner is really talking about, in some sense, is the similar bond um, among the women, um, similar parallel to this kind of important emotional and social bond under conditions of great divisiveness. Um, all which is to show that there's actually no good resting place. Um, and this is really what I would say about all three authors, is that you know I think that all of us want to bring them to rest at some point. And you know, they do come to rest in our own minds. Um, but I think that it's, it's always possible to give yet another twist to our interpretation uh, of what is going on and the range of possibilities that emerge from any one event. Um, so this is really uh, what's wonderful and challenging about those authors is that you know, something that seems to come to an end on one level. Actually, you know, if we just look at the largest possible level in the divisiveness um, on the level of, of geopolitics, uh, it turns out that there's actually a unifying level on a much smaller scale, right? So what, is, what seems a tragedy um, on one level can turn into a kind of a comedy of sorts, not straightforward comedy either, but comedy in the sense that allowing some hope to emerge. So I would amend Paul Fussell's uh, argument about the abridgment of hope in some way as well, is that yes, there is an abridgment of hope, but there's also the possible reconstitution of hope. Um, and what we're seeing in Absalom, Absalom is in some sense the reconstitution of hope. So I'm going to stop right here. Um, and once again, um, those of you who uh, didn't get, who came in late, let me just uh, say that I'll be uh, talking a little bit about writing in this class. This class uh, fulfills the writing requirement. And also, I uh, ask all of you uh, to sign both the sign-up sheet and also put down on the index class uh, your preferences for sections.